10 dying and rising gods, including Jesus. We're going to make Jesus number one, because my whole purpose in this video is to show you Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension is not an uncommon thing in the ancient world when gods or divine figures who are being worshipped are in the scene. The zeitgeist of the era was full of superstitions and mythologies that were developing. People believed in these things all the time. I'm going to be reading from Dr. Richard Carrier's article, and I hope you will go and read it yourself and follow up with his hyperlinks to see the source material for yourself. All of this literature is amazing, so I will be skimming through his article as I read it because it's so long, but it's full of great stuff. The name of his article is Dying and Rising Gods. It's pagan, guys. Get over it. Number one is Jesus. Born of a virgin, does miracles, lives his life, dies, crucified, buried in a tomb. After three days and three nights, just as Jonah, and he's spit up. And of course, in this particular one, he resurrects and ascends on high. Number two, Osiris. A lot can be said about Osiris, so let me read some and then leave the rest for you to read yourself. Not only does Plutarch say Osiris returned to life and was resurrected, exact terms for resurrection on Isis and Osiris, 35, see his discussion on the empty tomb, and also describe as physically returning to Earth after his death, but the physical resurrection of Osiris's corpse is explicitly described in pre-Christian pyramid inscriptions. Osiris was also resurrected, according to Plutarch, on the third day and died during a full moon, just like Christ. Passover occurs during the full moon. And in Plutarch, on Isis and Osiris, 39 and 42, Osiris dies on the 17th of Athar the concluding day of the full moon, and is raised on the 19th, two days later, thus three days inclusively, just like Jesus. Jesus dies on a full moon, Ice Osiris dies on a full moon, and when you look carefully at this on Isis and Osiris, chapter 42, it talks about the 17th day, and Pythagoreans have this weird number of 17, and they have a certain uh, superstition about the number. I want to tell you something interesting about this in the Gospels. The number 17 is a perfect triangular number. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 13 plus 14 plus 15 plus 16 plus 17 equals 153. When Jesus says to cast the net on the other side and they catch all these fish in the net, they capture 153 fish. This story also looks like Pythagoras' story. This are my notes. Plutarch writes that Osiris came to Horus from the other world and exercised and trained him for battle and taught him lessons. And then Osiris consorted with Isis after his death and she became the mother of Hippocrates. It's hard to get more explicit than that. Contrary to Airman, Dr. Carrier and Airman are going back and forth because Airman doesn't believe Osiris came back in the flesh. He spends the entire next paragraph describing, for example, I have come to thee that I may revivify thee that I may reassemble for thee thy bones, that I may collect for thee thy flesh, that I may assemble for, th for thee thy dismembered limbs. Raise thyself up, King Osiris. Thou livest, pyramid text. Raise thyself up, shake off thy dust, remove that dirt which is on thy face, loose thy bandages. It's clearly a resurrection on earth in the same body. This idea that we see that also is very similar to Jesus. And you have to, you really, common sense begs you to have to ask yourself, where did these ideas come from? They, they did not come in a vacuum bubble of Christianity. This stuff's been old. Ideas just floating around in the ancient world. Number three, Dionysus. Before I even read anything that he has to say, I highly recommend reading Dennis McDonald's work on Dionysus and the fourth gospel, the Dionysian gospel is the name of the book, and his work on Greek literature and its influence in the New Testament. 
Dionysus, also popularly known as Bacchus, had many different tales told of him, just as Osiris did. But in one popularly known, he was killed by his being torn apart as a baby. This is written in Justin Martyr Apology, Plutarch on Isis and Osiris, Diodorus, Library of History. He was then resurrected by a human woman, Semele, conceiving a new body for him in her womb after drinking a magic slushy made from bits of his corpse. This is a literal resurrection again, just by an elaborate mechanism. The god definitely dies and then returns to life by acquiring the same kind of body he once had, assembled and regrown from parts of his old one. In this version of this myth, he is a full god, son of Zeus and personify, but still mortal, capable of being killed by dismemberment like a vampire. He then is reborn a demigod from the womb of a fully mortal human woman. He was the savior god central to the Bacchic mysteries, one of the most widely known and celebrated in the Western world at the time. Those baptized into his cult received eternal life in paradise, and just like Christians, 1 Corinthians 15, Dionysians could even baptize themselves on behalf of the deceased loved ones and thus rescue those already dead. Number four, Zalmoxis. Zalmoxis was also a resurrected savior. Greeks making fun of the Thracian cult worshipping him made up the polemic that he didn't really die. He just hid in a cave and thus pretended to have resurrected from the dead. But this polemic tells us the Thracians did believe Zalmoxis had died and rose from the dead and appeared to disciples on earth to prove it. His disciples then believed they would benefit from his power to bring them into eternal life in paradise. In a book that became standard reading in the schools, Herodotus, which you really need to get a copy of, talks about reports that Salmoxus fed the leaders among his countrymen in a hall and taught them that neither he nor his guest nor any of their descendants would ever die, but that they would go to a place where they would live forever and have all good things and then vanished underground for three years while the Thracians wished him back and mourned him for dead. And then in the fourth year, he appeared to the Thracians and thus they came to believe what he had told them, thus using his own resurrection to prove theirs. Though I do wonder if it was actually three days, Carrier says, and not years, as that was the case in the resurrection cults of Osiris, Inanna, and Adonis, as we'll see shortly. The story entails these cultists believed in their savior gods a bodily death and resurrection, because that's the only way the Greek polemic Herodotus is citing would make sense, as it imagines Salmoxus appearing in some same body and visiting his followers to verify he was alive again, and not merely appearing in visions, nor as a ghost. Accordingly, Celsus, the earliest known critic of Christianity, included Salmoxus in his list of resurrected deities. Read Origin Against Celsus. Number five, Inanna. Inanna is the earliest known resurrected god. For her, a clear-cut death and resurrection tale exists on clay tablets inscribed in Sumeria over a thousand years before Christianity, plainly describing her humiliation, trial, execution, and crucifixion, and her resurrection three days later. After she is stripped naked and judgment is pronounced against her, Inanna is turned into a corpse and the corpse was hung from an L and after three days and three nights, her assistants ask for her corpse and resurrect her by feeding her the water and food of life. And Inanna arose according to what had been her plan all along because she knew her father would surely bring me back to life. These are her words. And the story quotations are from the tablet adopting the translation of Samuel Noah Kramer in history begins at Sumer. This cult continued to be practiced into the Christian period, Tyre being a major center of her worship. By then, there's some evidence her resurrection tale was shifted to her consort Tammuz, one of the several resurrected deities the Greeks called Adonis. Number six. 
Adonis. Adonis was the title of at least one, if not several, resurrected saviors by the time Christianity began, sometimes equated with Tammuz, or possibly one confused with Tammuz, but either way, certainly a resurrected god. Mettinger details this in a study of the riddle of resurrection, dying and rising gods in the ancient Near East includes discussion of the pre-Christian manuscript of a private letter in which a man likens his ability to survive several deadly uprisings to Tammuz's ability to always return from the dead, which would certainly suggest Tammuz had by then become the center of his own resurrection cult. This is the same God for whose death even women in Jerusalem mourned, Ezekiel 8. 14 through 15. There's no evidence he remained dead. That letter alone attests it was commonly known he returned to life. And in the third century AD, the Christian scholar Origen says in his comments on Ezekiel, explaining the very same passage, that Tammuz was still worshipped in his own day under the title of Adonis. And as such, certain rites of initiation are conducted for him. First, that they weep for him since he had died. Second, that they rejoice for him because he has risen from the dead. This is confirmed a century later by Jerome's commentary on Ezekiel. Recent pre-Christian finds attest that indeed a period of rejoicing followed mourning the death of Tammuz, which matches Origen's description. We similarly have it described by a pagan author, either Lucian or someone else of the second century AD, who describes national ceremonies of mourning for Adonis's death that are followed the next day by celebrations of his returning to life and ascending into outer space killed by a beast he becomes a dead person then he is buried and mourned and the next day they proclaim he lives and he ascends number seven romulus Romulus was another widely known pre-Christian resurrected god, not a personal savior, so far as we know, but a national one, in his exalted form named Quirinius. According to ancient sources, this demigod was a pre-existent divine being who became incarnate to, in order to establish a kingdom, conceiving a body for himself within the womb of a virgin, possibly by sexual means, it's unclear who was murdered by the Roman Senate, which is the Roman equivalent of the Sanhedrin, after which his corpse vanishes, the sun goes out, and people flee in fear and mourn his death. Then he returns to earth alive again, resurrected in a new divine body, to preach his gospel to the disciples, Proculus, before departing to rule from on high. By some accounts, Romulus ascended directly to heaven and his mortal body burned away in the sky, but either way, his mortal body dies. I have finished my mortal life, he tells Proculus, Dionysus says, and he returns to preach in an immortal body, then ascends heaven just like Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 50. Our fullest account comes from Plutarch, Life of Romulus, 27 to 28, writing at the end of the first century AD, but Romulus's death and return to life are attested in numerous pre-Christian sources. Number eight, Asclepius. Asclepius was also a popular resurrected god. Christian apologists want to try and deny this by saying Asclepius merely, like Caesar, rose to heaven like a ghost upon his death. But that isn't what the ancient worshippers said. Celsus reported that a great many Greek and barbarians claim they have frequently seen and still see no mere phantom but Asclepius himself. Origin against Celsus 3:24. Asclepius was killed by a lightning strike and buried. Hesiod fragments 125. Euripides, Cicero on the nature of the gods. Origin against Celsus 3:23. He was then restored from death to becoming a living god. As Ovid says, by a god he was turned into a bloodless corpse, and then from a corpse became a god, twice renewing his fate. That this was regarded a resurrection is fully confirmed by the narrative. Zeus killed Asclepius for resurrecting the dead. But when the slain's father, Apollo, complained, Zeus relented and restored Asclepius back to life. 
This time as an immortal god, Ovid thus remarks that Zeus did for his son's sake that which he forbade be done. In other words, Zeus forbade raising the dead, but made an exception for Asclepius. It is thus understood that Zeus rose Asclepius from the dead. He had been a corpse, so he would have remained, but by the miracle of God, now was alive, eternal and immortal, supernaturally powerful, just like Jesus. Number nine, Baal. Baal was one of the most ancient of resurrected gods. His death is probably the same mourned under the name Hadad Rimon in Zechariah 12.11. But whether or not in pre-Christian text, Baal's corpse is found by a knot. So in his myth, the god is definitely dead. One text even outright says, and the gods will know that you are dead. And multiple gods actually declare him dead. He is then buried and funeral rites performed. Read Metager Riddle. There are then clear references to Baal's resurrection. In fact, his returning to life and then living forever are used as analogies in pre-Christian immortality spells. Though this god was then not yet a personal savior, but a metaphor for communal agricultural salvation, that was prior to Hellenization. He was transformed into one of the many personal savior gods of the region we hear of at the dawn of Christianity, but are allowed to know nothing about owing to the medieval Christian destruction of pagan evidence. For example, Hippolytus devoted two entire chapters of his refutation of all heresies to the mystery cults and their savior deities. Curiously, those are the only two books wholly destroyed. Go figure. What were the medievals trying to hide? What did they not want us to read? I'll let your imagination ponder. Number 10, Hercules. Hercules, or also known as Melkart, is another of the most ancient of resurrected deities akin to Baal in both his origins and possible future co-option in later Hellenistic mystery cults. His legend became fused with that of Hercules, centuries before Christianity and attested by authors of the Roman period. Another person wrote that Hercules was killed by Typhon, but Laulus brought a quell to him, and having put it close to him and ritually burning it, he smelt it and came to life again. And Josephus attests to ongoing celebrations of resurrecting Hercules in Jewish antiquities, mistranslated in Winston, see Medinger. In both accounts, this is explicitly said to be the story of the Tyrian Hercules, which we know meant Melkart, whose base of worship was Tyr. Diodorus tells another story of Hercules killed by a fire, dying of poison. He's burned on a pyre because his bones then vanished when Laulus tried to collect them. The story goes, it was concluded Hercules was resurrected and ascended to heaven. The supposition of resurrection upon the vanishing of a corpse was not only a common motif in antiquity, it is essentially the story told of Jesus. You could take a deep dive into that. The addition of appearance narratives to still the deal also accompanies many of these tales, Romulus, for example, and there may have been such for Hercules, but in any event, it was clearly believed he had died and been raised from the dead and then ascended to heaven with divine power, just like Jesus. Read the rest of Carrier's article. It is so worth reading. I ask anyone interested in seeing the comparisons. Here are 10 dying and rising gods, including Jesus, to show you there's nine more other than this one. And we used to say this one was the one true one and everyone else is wrong. I say that's a bunch of baloney. And anyone who's honest shouldn't hold double standards for other gods and their claims over Jesus. I say they're all outdated mythology and understanding of the world. Even though I love myth, I love learning about these stories and how people believe like this and why. What is that porous line between the dead and the living? And why do they come up with these ideas and believe this way? 
If you enjoyed this work, please go check out Dr. Carrier's article, get a book or two of his. I really appreciate what he does. You can also support us here at Myth Vision so we can keep bringing you this content. Become a patron, join the YouTube membership program. We have a thanks button here in the bottom of this video that you can click and donate that way. I have one-time donation options as well. You can email me if you have any questions. Please don't stop at one and recognize these are all myths. Never forget, we are Myth Vision.